that. Oh, okay, good. I'm just waiting for that. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Nikki Jeffs, and I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, presentation. I am an assistant instructional designer for USU, and I will turn the time over to our pres presenter, uh, Richard Saunders. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Saunders. I'm a, a librarian down here at uh, Southern Utah University, but I also have a PhD in history mostly in modern America, and a good portion of this kind of grows out of my interest in, in teaching history and in using um, ways to, inter to get students interacting in doing something substantive. So I'm going to share my screen, I hope. Can you see that, I hope? We'll go through there. Um, yes, the title's a little bit long, which is why I let it run off the edge, because I thought it was kind of clever. Um, I'm interested in figuring out how to use open education as a way to really improve um, student grades and retention. OER makes a difference. I've seen it happen. I've, I've watched students um, and seen some, some internal studies for how effective it works. Um, OER make it possible to involve students in creating learning tools for later generations. And that gives them a reason to, uh, to, for them to treat their own work seriously. You're welcome to, uh, welcome to get in touch with me with questions or comments. Um, I'm also gonna send a, uh, a file of samples, which I'm going to hopefully cut and paste. Um, nope, I can't cut and paste out of there, but I will, I will cut and paste it into the chat box and you'll be able to download my examples and a number of links that I'll be referring to as we go through things. To start with, I'd like to begin with a really wise statement by uh, Sterling Church, who was a former student services administrator uh, here at Southern Utah University, but he's also one of my neighbors, uh, which really is the mission statement for the perspective that I've started to really develop in the idea of uh, involving students and creating things of lasting value. Um, text and text books tend to be multi-part systems. You know, we think of the textbook as a, or, or a text as something that's fairly monographic and has a beginning, a middle, and end. Um, what we forget is that textbooks usually are produced by villages. There's all kinds of other things that go with them. Typically in the business, we call them ancillaries. Um, they're valuable. Uh, they add value to a thing and they're, they appeal to professors. They're you know, quiz banks, illustration sets, readings, all kinds of things like that. The problem is that the OER that exists in the, in the world today mostly don't have those kinds of things. So professors actually have to either make them up on their own or do without. And I decided that there's, there's really not, that's not the good way to do it. There's, we haven't yet developed ancillaries that go along with um, OER, but I think there's ways to do that. And so you can do it, we can look at it in a number of different ways and it, it works across, uh, across fields as well. Um, things like primary source collections, you can see the list right here. The model that I'm gonna be showing you today is based on my approach to a number of history courses that have been taught by both me and a number of other people. Uh, they're intended to supplement education with participation. In other words, give students opportunities to produce small pieces of high quality public consumption, research and writing, and then provide real life access to that. I tend to see this, I tend to do this when I teach upper division classes and instruct them to write for people who are at a lower division level so that it's not something that they have to worry terribly much if they make an error. Uh, and the process lends, it to all, it lends itself to all this kind of thing. What it really is, I guess, if you take a look at it, is the idea of crowdsourcing for open education, involving students in creating things that, that will then get used to teach other students in the process. Now, this is most, you can make it work for an individual course or an individual set of courses that an individual teaches, but it's really powerful when you start contributing to larger things that are cooperatives between department members or better yet, between institutions. The challenge is that there's a bit of lacking as far as infrastructure goes, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, the traditional model of education coming out of the 1940s and 50s and earlier is uh, you students do some sort of research, they write a research paper that really means nothing to them other than the exercise of having it and getting uh, graded. 
Um, the problem is that's really inherited from a distant past. It, it works, but it doesn't work as well as we'd like it to. The open access model involves students meaningfully in creation. And I think that works best when we can integrate more than just producing something. And that's why that's where I'm going with this. Um, the idea, and I'm gonna walk you through a series of steps that, that I found useful and, and provide some examples of how that works. Number one, the faculty need to set standards. They need to perhaps create models for what the ideal submission would look like, and then instructions for both contributions and also the review process that will get integrated in this process as well. Um, I encourage the use of things like uh, teaching assistance or, or class assistance as, a, as an editorial board, the equivalent of an editorial board, to help with the idea of, of monitoring and review or developing stuff. It's, it's basically a project-based learning approach that will allow those who are going to teach at some point or teaching assistants to learn themselves through the process of developing educational structures themselves. So you're, you're providing a teaching, a learning opportunity for teaching assistants in addition to just the students who are going through it. Um, sometimes you can use curriculum grants to fund student help in the process. Uh, just remember that if you're doing that, that you're, what you're doing is really building for them a, a valid resume item that they take forward with them as well. The challenge um, is to create opportunities for creation. And I encourage people to do that in small batches rather than a constant process of, of creating something new. Um, in other words, do three or four maybe during a term rather than 15 over a term. Um, the challenge obviously then if you're going to do that means that you must get documentation. You need to get a signed right statement from the student which acknowledges them as the creator but also allows you to get for a Creative Commons license along with the submission. The, the big part of it that goes with that is the idea of metadata. And that is metadata helps to organize and to also to sort. It includes as well as precludes and it depends partly on the item type of whatever you're creating and it depends partly on the platform that you're using to both house and disseminate material. For instance, things like creator, the creator's name, the school that they go to. Um, if you have a set of controlled terms uh, like tags or GPS coordinates or uh, technical settings or file names or, or a set of answers that go along with things uh, or even just basic description. For instance, if you're dealing with geology, um, well, you could take the example of you want the, 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 the book or text unit name or number and what it is, for instance, if it's, if it's a series of images of cross bedding, then you might wanna say it's from Navajo sandstone, it's early Jurassic, uh, that it's a time scale of you know, 185 to 180 million years ago, uh, that it's the North American plate, that it's fossil sand dune, that it's Zion National Park, uh, the GPS coordinates for that particular image, and then the photographer identification, you wanna do that. If you're doing something in mathematics, it might be something like a unit name or number, um, that it's long division, that's a three digit divisor, that it's a five digit dividend, that's an even quotient or a remainder quotient or a quotient to X places, X decimal places, and then obviously the creator name. So there's, there's ways to, to get that information when you get a submission as you go forward with it. Um, the other part that you wanna make sure that that's in, involved is it's not merely the idea of um, creating something, but the downstream that the process of checking and review, because you know students occasionally make mistakes, right? So use students to, and be very upfront about it in using, uh, in, in developing them as problem checkers. So say if you're in a math, in your math class or a physics class, that's okay, um, here are five, uh, five problems that have been generated by other students just like you, your job is to check them and make sure there are no errors. Show your work so that you can prove that. If you find an error, this is the result. Um, you can em embed them into you know, future real life applications as well because they will be doing that as professionals at some point probably. Um, like I said, I use this for lower division students so that they get practice in something and then eventually 
the review identifies not only errors, but also provides a non-threatening way to discuss in class or in, in some sort of a discussion base why the error was made and how to prevent it. Um, sometimes you can actually pair, the, uh, pair things with another course, so you would involve another course as well. I'll go through that in a second. The idea of platforms is a, a bit of a challenge, and if you'll hold on a second, I'll show you some platforms the way it works. Like I said, I find it most advisable if we can do things in terms of um, um, cooperative ventures or things that, to which many people contribute or many institutions contribute to handle the upload and the storage and the retrieval and the delivery and all those kinds of things. Uh, one way we could do that perhaps is to use like an access database and upload via a spreadsheet. So think about it in what terms students get. Yes, they get credits. Um, yes, they get some availability with content, which is really useful. But they also get the, the opportunity to model a professional skill at professional level. If somebody else is going to read this, that means something to them. If it's just for their work, then who cares what it looks like? It doesn't matter much. What do faculty get out of it? Well, they get an engaged labor student. They get in, engaged labor, uh, engaged students, but they also get things like free labor. They help develop, the students help develop the course content so that you don't always have to rely either on a commercial project product that costs students money or that, um, that they have no interest in. So you get things that people are interested in. Plus, ultimately, there's an open resource I hope that would be useful. Now, let me show you a couple of um, a couple of examples as we're going through here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. For instance, if uh, there has been a really, really solid one that's actually been developed and is available, you'll find this link on the sheet that I'll I'll make sure that's available for everybody. This is uh, Intermountain Histories, uh, which is run out of Brigham Young University, but takes contributions from all over the place. And if you've ever used this, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it's, a, it's basically a guide that students write small pieces of, of history. They provide images, they provide locations, and then it gets uploaded into this. This is publicly available. If you're driving down I-15, you can follow what's going on around you as you travel. It's a fascinating bit of work. Um, you might take a look at Wikipedia articles, for instance. And a reminder, by the way, John Fisher is presenting this afternoon on using wikis at 2.40, so you may want to sit in his as well. Um, problem sets. Um, there's a way to do problem sets that's a bit challenging, but it's, it's, it works. The good news is with mathematics, because they're factual, they're not subject to copyright, so you don't have to have permissions in the same way. Story problems are subject to copyright, so you want to make sure that you get a permission statement there. Uh, I encourage the use of, of, whoops, there we go, Canvas Commons um, to build a set, a problem set or a quiz set, and then make it, upload it, make it available. Um, other people can can contribute and, and use that as well. If that's done on a regular basis, you simply build the thing larger and larger and larger. Um, primary source documents. Um, for instance, a class could use Google Drive uh, set by class, remember to set the permission to viewer for all of the content. Uh, there will be sample content in, in the links that will, I'll show you some of the things that my students have done and the model that I've used for them. Um, Another interesting thing that can be done is image banks. Um, for instance, medical x-rays, either you know, to show what a break looks like in a femur, to show you know, high break and low break. Um, geological features, microscope slides. Um, in, that, in this case, however, if you're going to choose to do an image bank, descriptive metadata becomes critical, especially for things like technical images where you need to deal with staining and camera settings and, and, and magnification and resolution, things like that. Um, let me think. The other part that's really important is to make sure that you let other people into the process. Yes, it can be done for you and your classes, but it's much better if you can collaborate with other folks to get their students to integrate as well, because these, the, the larger the, the community of contributors, the more significant it becomes to the people 
who are asked to write for it, it, it becomes it becomes an honor to spend, to have your work accepted in there. Um, you can also involve people across disciplines. For instance, you could involve a technical writing class to help with editing and the, and the process of editing. You might get a graphics design class to help with the design of the, of the digital tool you might use. You might use a marketing class to manage the front facing um, advertising for the, for the thing that you're being, being created. You might involve a, a computer class to help with platform administration over the long term. So those are, those are ways to, to involve things outside of your own discipline to make sure that people get, get to use it. Um, and then the idea is putting it to use. Now, the novelty in this idea that I've, I've handed out is, is really the cyclical process that students create, that students proof, that students improve the piece of work, that they supplement small pieces of work used by other students and that are shared openly. Uh, volume becomes the security against cheating or plagiarism. They, you, you can't have everything in mind, so you don't have to find one thing out of the system. You, gain, you beat the system by simply flooding it with content. They're, not, they're able to, to randomly select, or the, the, what they do is randomly select, or they go out and look for something um, and then document material. And then putting it to use, you give students creation for the a credit for the creation of what they have done, actually credit them in the work. Uh, it gives them familiarity with content. It gives them an opportunity to model professional skills. And the, the more widely available these kinds of tools are, the more attractive they are and the more seriously they're taken by the students who create them. So let me just kind of wind up before we go into questions with, with what Sterling had pointed out in the first place, and that is students tend to value what they help create. So giving them an opportunity, accredited opportunity to create and to improve gives them a reason to be invested in the educational process itself in, in whatever course you choose to work with. Um, that's pretty much it. Otherwise, thanks for that. And you can find me at here. Any questions? I went really faster than I had anticipated. Uh, Richard, um, I, I actually wrote and <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's not COVID in any way. We couldn't get it online virus anyway. Um, yeah, we're good. An open education resource um, uh, textbook and media law based on Wikipedia. I gave a um, a um, <coughs> a um, presentation at our annual conference here, and it's amazing. The first I expected to be thrown with brick bats and tomatoes and and all sorts of things for having the audacity to suggest it. We had a ETA conference uh, by um, a seminar by someone at um, Canadian University discussing it. It was amazing. I had, I had a lawyer from the business school and others come up to me and say, um, including a chemistry professor at U, uh, USU came up and said, you know, we've been working with Wikipedia for 10 or 15 years. And he said, I have never found an error on the Wikipedia pages because they collaborate with it. So there's just an extraordinary amount of, uh, of synergies you can have. Right now I'm comparing it uh, online with, um, with a traditional textbook to see where I can tweak it and see student, uh, uh, student um, reactions. But I think the next frontier may well be in uh, uh, Sage Open, which is something we use in my field. Um, I, I review for them as well. Um, whether we can, uh, whether the academy will allow, uh, some would call it um, some sort of creep, either uh, however you want to irony look at that, um, uh, whether we're going to be able to release information in a scholarly accepted peer reviewed format in an open education uh, um, environment. I'm, I'm very excited about that possibility, but the issue is whether this will advantage or disadvantage people who are moving up the tenure, um, you know, going from assistant associate, associate to full, or whether it will be looked at rather uh, 
negatively. I'm just kind of interested in your thoughts on that. Well, you're you're, you're right on there, and I w I've been an advocate for making sure that departmental policies and college policies, university policies specifically include some sort of statement on, on open education. It doesn't have to mean that they agree with exactly what happens, but it needs to be recognized. Um, I think one of the, there, there's two ways to do it. Number one, you can say, oh, number one, pedagogically, that this person is innovative and they're, interview, they're involving their students in the creation of, of useful material. I think that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, open education, you know, you're media licensing, you understand it. It doesn't all have to be just a CC by. It can be a CC by no derivatives, which has been sometimes been called the academic copyright that distributes uh, material openly. Now, I work uh, with the EBSCO ebook collection here and I was stunned to find out that more than half of the EBSCO ebook collection is the Knowledge Unlimited database of freely available stuff. So we're paying EBSCO, but EBSCO is not paying KU, Knowledge, uh, knowledge Unlatched. Um, so part of the question that we as, as educators have to wrestle with is, if there's not money attached to it, is there value to it? And I think that's that's the broader question because, for instance, I edit a uh, I edit a journal that has moved to open. It's still peer reviewed. Um, the the submissions are are all vetted by at least three people before they before they come back to my desk. And it's working in some of these small fields. The, the problem that it hasn't been working. It, the, the challenge that it, it faces to the large publishers is how do they make them how do they make money off of a text off of open and the and they're doing it if you're if I used to work in publishing back in the 90s and I was I was stunned to find out that you know the real cost of a textbook is not the book itself it's the ancillaries that go with it and that's that's been the motivation for me as I've as I've thought okay if I can give them an open textbook, then I need, if I can give them also an opportunity to help produce the ancillaries that go along with the open textbook. Okay, so that kind of went through three or four different subjects, but does, does that kind of give you my opinion on the way that, that, that things might unfold? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think also the issue, U USU has a through the library has a program where they will match departmental match mm -hmm. uh, for OER. The problem is when you have, I had one when I wrote with two other authors and they had no funding. Right. And I only had a third. I'm not saying that's fair. I mean, I'm not saying it's not, right. not saying it's, uh, it's absolutely fair, but as a result, we were unable to, uh, we were unable to submit it because uh, none of us could put up the extra thousand dollars it cost to the uh, um, to the uh, uh, the open resource uh, publication that was going to do it. A publisher's a public right. a publisher's fee. So as a result, we weren't able to get access to that. We now uh, submitted it to a uh, quote traditional journal, but um, I, I don't know how. I mean, that's that's the funding model. I I don't know. Um, yeah, don't know that's one of those irresolvable. Uh, problems. But well, inter it, it, interestingly it, it, enough, and I'll tip my hand here just a little bit. Um, Daniel, I've got, I've got a list that's, I'll put up in the chat. Let me see if I can get it out of the, uh, out of my presentation. Uh, um, the Utah legislature is getting, is going to be pushed by a couple of university presidents, I think, perhaps in this, this year, maybe next year, about exactly the issue that you raise. Um, well, let me, I'm grabbing the link and I will put it in the chat here just a second. Oh, that's not it. There we go. Okay, Daniel, the, the link that I just put in the chat will download a, a folder of material that has both my examples 
and the links in it for the prep for the uh, platforms that you might use to do um, to do sharing back and forth. And great, thank you. The the scale that I would really like to see it on has not yet been developed in the way that I would like it to be. That's going to require some uh, some additional effort on everybody's part, I think, in order to, to make it work. The publishers have, have, made, it, have made them available, um, but they are very proprietary about both their software and their structure, and they have a vested interest in seeing things go. Now, let me, let me back up and say again, um, I'm hoping that the Utah legislature will act sometime very soon on a statewide um, initiative to make OER a default preference within education in the state. If we did that, uh, I happen to know that part of the, mo part of the model is a funding model to, to publish and disseminate exactly what Thomas you had, would, would need to deal with. And from all accounts, the idea will work. What we need to do is, is have some officiality behind it to, to give it some nuts and bolts um, enforceability. Anything from anybody else? That was shorter than I thought. I maybe talked too fast. Can I ask a question, Richard? Certainly. So since you're a librarian, what I'm wondering is how, how might faculty involve the library in this process? Well, if faculty are wise, one thing that they will do is involve a librarian in helping with things like primary source research, with image research, with the idea of what are you giving away when you've licensed something that's open. Um, Faculty don't have to be the experts on all of that. If they deal with content and broad issues, the librarians can probably help with the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of finding material and helping students negotiate the idea of what finding means in a particular discipline's information ecosystem. Um, that's the way that, uh, that I've seen it. Now, I happen to be, I have to, happen to have two hats, but, as I watched my students initially kind of stir around, one of the things that they would do is they would, they would get caught down rabbit holes. They'd find something interesting and then they would chase it and they had a great time with it. But at the same time, um, they would often come to me and say, I'm, I'm, here's what I wanna find and I can't find it. What do you suggest? Um, and sometimes the answer is, well, there isn't a digital version of that that I know of. And that's part of learning experiences to say, okay, not all of the world is digital. There was a time prior to digital where people actually shared things hand to hand and you may have to go looking for things that way and then create a digital resource. And that, you know, that's part of this, part of this whole process is this, rather than creating a, a monolithic textbook or monolithic ancillaries, that we create a system of, of creation and evolution that can grow and especially in historical fields like geology, um, you know, for, for years and years, the idea of tectonic plates just didn't resonate with anybody. And then all of a sudden in the 1960s, that was the answer. And now we have a new body of, of knowledge. Things fall in and out of fashion. And so you'll see that in and out of things as students create and as they contribute. And that's part of the, that's part of the information ecosystem. Thanks. Thanks for answering that, Richard. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, if not, then that's fine. I will let you go. I actually have to go teach class right now. <laughs> um, I was going to give you your five minute warning anyway. So okay. we're pretty close to time. So it looks pretty good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for attending. I'm happy to answer questions as people go along um, and we'll go from there. 
And if anybody is interested, there is a uh, form that you can fill out that's in the chat. You can follow that link to give any feedback on the presentation. I hope you all have a really great day. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you much. We'll see you.